Great. Part three of demo day, I guess it is here in class. Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying this. Um, you know, you gave up your critiques to have a lot more painting time today. Um, so, so far we've gone over yeah. the uh, glazing and scumbling and temperature shifts within transparent areas um, and sky holes in the first painting. Second painting was the subtractive painting style done with all transparent paints. For the third demo today, it's going to be a 12 inch by 12 inch panel. And it is going to be based on a painting I did previously, sort of. Um, I put it onto our Padlet already. It's a bad photo, unfortunately, of the painting, but it's the one with the bright pink clouds. Um, I told you last week about the, um, I think it's literally called bright pink, uh, tube from yeah. Michael Harding. Um, brilliant pink. And so I will be using that as my guest color in this painting. So I'll be using the full split primary palette, even though it's going to be a very warm and pink, purple, reddish painting for the most part. Um, part of me wants to pull out the Payne's gray, but I think I'm going to fight that urge just so I don't have two guest colors. Um, and for those of you know, for for those of you who haven't used the split primary palette. You know, you may want to fight the urge to invite um, uh, guest colors right away. You may want to just experiment with the six colors and white for a little while. Um, I, I understand, you know, inviting them and I, I, you know, have guests in every one of my paintings. So I'm not going to tell you not to by any means, but it may slow down your getting um, comfortable with just the two reds, two yellows and two blues. So anyways. Just a little bit of a note on that. I'm going to jump up to the easel. Got a new 12 inch by 12 inch set up there. I went ahead and added the other colors to the primary palette. So let me get rid of that brown. It's not going to be used. No transparent earth red in this painting. Um, I've got my uh, titanium white. My, which yellow am I using? Hansa yellow light. Indian yellow, which red am I using? Naphthal scarlet is my warm red. Again, I just hardly care which red, warm red I use. If it's cad red light, cad red medium, I just grab one out of the drawer and I don't, I'm not so particular. I do know that the naphthal scarlet um, is a semi-transparent, so maybe I should have done an opaque there, but I'm going to be applying the paint thicker, um, so it's going to appear opaque. You can make transparent opaque simply by putting it on thicker or by mixing it with an opaque paint. Meaning like any color with white is going to become opaque because titanium white is quite opaque. Um, I've got my ultramarine blue and my manganese blue. So that's kind of an interesting palette I've got up there. All of them are actually semi-transparent. I didn't really think about that very well. But we're gonna be painting thicker. How about that? More opaque <laughs> more opaque because it's thicker. Um, I'm going to start by staining my canvas a little bit again. And I'm just adding a touch of paint thinner. Last time I added too much, it was a little bit slippery. I do not want that, especially because I know I'm going to be um, adding paint on top. I'm using my quinacridone red this time. That's crazy. I'm going to mix in manganese blue. My maybe I'll maybe I'll mix in my ultramarine. I'm going to mix, mix in ultramarine blue. Is this just with gams all? A little tiny bit, a very little tiny bit. I do not want this surface slick because I know that I'm coming back in and painting on top of it. I'm going to try to get as close to finished with this painting in the next. 50 minutes as I can. Can you show us your reference? Sure. It's just a big mess. Well, <laughs> I, haven't made my, I haven't pinned it, sorry. But yeah, it's just a big mess. It's going to have some ground form on the bottom, uh, kind of a darker sky. Let me just pin that. So, Oh, it says I am spotlighted, spotlit. 
when it, when you guys talk, does it stay on me? No, it stays on the painting. Oh. It does. Okay, great. All right, now I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm just going to slightly wipe that down. This is a great way to also get rid of if it's too slippery, like you have, you have added too much paint thinner. All you have to do is simply take your paper towel. It will absorb most of it. I am going to be covering pretty much all of this surface up, I hope, but still nice to have kind of a nice color in the background. Okay. Mix some other colors really quick. So I'm going to grab, I'm going to kind of go from the top of my sky down. I'm going to have a horizon line right about here, really quite low. I can go ahead and throw that in so you guys can be visualizing what I'm thinking. Let's go ahead and make just a darker purple. Okay, so that'll be kind of my horizon line. Down here, I'll have some kind of marshy grasses, get some trees going on in here in just a little bit. And then it's going to be darker down towards the horizon line. And we'll have some, a little bit of fog feeling in here. And then we are going to use dun, 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 our guest color, brilliant pink. You could make this color um, somewhat similar. I should probably experiment to see if I can actually make that color with my palette. I haven't really been able to yet. So knowing that the diva is going to be these bright pink clouds floating over the top of this kind of dark background color, I'm going to want to kind of play that up. So if I'm using pink as my diva, which is a nice color for a diva, um, what colors kind of might make that show off a little better behind it. Go yellow. Ahead. What's that? You like yellows? Yellows a little bit, not too much. Yellows are almost going to be brighter and lighter possibly than the pink. Oh. Carillion? Whoa, what color is Carillion? The, the blue on the right. Oh, Cerulean? Oh, Thank Cerulean. <laughs> I didn't say yeah, it. I mean, maybe it is called Carillion. You might be saying I've, it right. I have no idea. That's funny. I doubt it. <laughs> I've, no, I've Either. heard it pronounced both ways. So I've, You I've, are the, the professor. So green, right? Yeah, you have a green, because the opposite of red is oh, really. Green. So oh. if I make a very vibrant pink, maybe a grayed down kind of greenish color may really work well. So I'm going to kind of make like an aquamarine color, and then I'm going to make it hideous. <laughs> All right, because that's very, very bright, very happy. Um, it's almost, almost fighting with the diva there. So I need to gray that down. So I've got green here. What color am I going to use to gray down green? If you guys have got your color wheel memorized in your head. Red. Red. Yeah, good job. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to reach for my quinacra and make it go towards purple. Whew, that was strong. A little bit of red really affects green. All right. Too much, in fact. Wow. Who would have known my quinacra would have been so strong? Add a little more ultramarine, a little more 
server uh, manganese. Let's see what we've got right now. It just got a very, very dark color. So I almost need to add white to it to see what we've come up with. Oh boy, we might be off to the races already. That is a nice gray. That, ooh, I like that. Can you guys see that? A little bit greenish, a lot gray. I like that. Okay. Might let I'll be here up. another hour, maybe. Huh? I'll be here another hour. On the lower? Yeah. Uh -huh. If he does after. Mind uh, <laughs> muting yourself when you're. You want to be with me? No, ahead. no, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Somebody is talking in the background. You don't have your mute on. Oh, sorry, that was me. Husband was telling me bye. <laughs> Tell your husband bye for all of us. Yeah, try to remember to mute. I'm wondering how green I can get. It's always an experiment. Kind of liking where it's going, maybe a little darker. So I'm just working on my background colors that are going to be coming down from the top. I'll probably be able to use some of these colors within my reflected grasses and different things like that. Um, I think I'm liking where it's going. I want to see what happens if I mix some of this pink in with that, where that goes. So much of painting is literally just asking what if, what if, what if. And doing little quick experiments. It's definitely neutralized it down quite a lot, which is nice for the areas that aren't going to be my prima donna, but are still related. Still interacting with some of that same light. Oh, I just love this transition from this pale green. Oh, it's almost invisible for you guys, but pale green gray over to the pink there. It's really so many of my paintings. It's just this little bit of experimenting over here on the left side on the palette that all of a sudden make their way into the painting because, you know, as Bob Ross says, right? So it's happy accidents, but it's not really an accident, it's just an experiment. Okay. And then what else I'm going to have? Man, I could use maybe a lot of that. Crazy thing is, is I, I might be almost ready to get started. I don't think I mixed up big enough pallets or uh, uh, big enough piles of paint. Make some just black, some very dark. Get the bigger pile of that. Big run out. So, Michael, I, I have a question. If you have your split palette out, do you have to use every single color? No, I haven't it, touched my Indian yellow yet. Okay. Oh, you definitely don't. Um, I just find eventually I am. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, there's the yellow, it's a cooler yellow, or it's a warmer yellow, or it's a greener yellow, or an orangey or yellow, whatever else. Like, I, I, I can definitely see I'll probably use the Indian yellow right at the begin bottom of this underside of these pink clouds to make them warmer on the, you know, underneath where the sun is hitting them. Okay. But no, you don't have to. You don't have to do anything you don't want. Absolutely. 
and if it you know you don't need it you don't need it sometimes my you know some of my more favorite paintings have even less colors um you know just that one of each primary can do a lot of damage i mean make a lot of beautiful things do you always use um, ultramarine and your red with a little bit of the Hansa light yellow to make black? He, or I, if I have that transparent earth red, I'll use transparent earth red um, with the ultramarine. Or if I have burnt umber, burnt umber and ultramarine make great blacks. Um, but, or if I have uh, phthalo green, Thalo green and quinacridone make beautiful, um, very transparent blacks or quite transparent blacks. So there's lots of ways to get to it. And generally it's not really black. Again, if I mix white with this, let's see what color it starts to lean towards. Kind of a plum. Um, so it's not a true black, you know, if I, if I mixed white with it and it went to gray, like a neutral gray, then I would know I mixed a great black. All right, well, time is flying. 35 minutes left, we'll see. All I have out are these crazy shot brushes. So I have to decide if I wanna paint with those or paint with a little more control here with one of these. Reaching in my drawer of hundreds of brushes here to pick out a couple to play with today. Who wants to paint? Let's try that. Got a big one here because I'm going to be covering quite a bit of area. I'm going to start, start with my darks and then go from dark to light basically. This background is a little bit slippery still because of that paint thinner on there. Um, so again, if it was, you know, if I wasn't teaching a class, I would probably set this painting aside because it would be dry in about 15, 20 minutes, but maybe it'll work. <laughs> Sometimes I forget you guys are watching. I'm just like, ugh, what a crazy thing I'm doing right now. Nobody paints like that. Who paints just dabs of color? Looks ridiculous. The final result that counts. <laughs> yep. Now it's just a acne covered teenage kid. It's just in its very awkward stages right now. Is, is this technique going to be covered in the brushwork class next semester? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dabbing I'm up for that. Dab, I would... dab, dab, dab. <laughs> the dab method. Um, no, but it's a way to kind of get, you know, even like those, the water that I was talking about in the very first painting, um, where, you know, now I can come through and simply smooth that out, but I'm going to add more paint. It's not enough. I accidentally dip my whole brush in my paint thinner, which is too much. So I'm wiping it off with my paper towel. I do not, I just want a little bit of paint thinner to help this paint move. And this time I am going to go ahead and do the background and then paint my foreground over the top, but it, I'll probably be a little bit of both. I'll probably come back into it here in a little bit. 
And I'm just kind of getting things covered. I'm testing colors, making a strange and ugly background. But I'm again with the knowledge that I'm building a stage set for my diva to show off. I know that she's super proud of her bright pink dress or outfit or whatever you want to, whatever you want to keep this story going. Um, and so how am I going to show that off by putting it up against kind of a really odd green, gray, blue color. So I'm thinking the opposite color, pink to green, but I'm also thinking vibrant versus dulled down in gray. It's kind of hard to see with this really dark, I mean, super bright, vibrant pink there, um, what I'm going to be chasing after. So I might have to come in and get rid of some of that here in just a second so that I can actually visualize it. Because sometimes when you do a bright background color, it makes it very hard to see your colors as you're putting them on until you get it covered. It's just our every color changes accordingly to what's next to it or it's just how our eyes work we can't not let that happen so sometimes you just kind of got to come in and knock that out which is going to be fine and fun and let's do it so i'm just making a nice dark but I'm kind of trying to keep it in the same value, uh, color scheme a, a little bit as these background, as the sky color, because it's in that same world. So um, my reference, I'm actually super unhappy with my weird tree shapes. So I get an opportunity to kind of improve on those, maybe make them a little more interesting. A little more diversity in shape. We're all about diversity in my class. Some are taller, some are shorter, some are thicker, some are thinner. We like them all. So again, right now, I'm just uh, trying to get that covered, uh, this ground. So I'm getting rid of my lava pink here so that I can see what it is I'm working with. See how these colors are playing together. Just using those cheap shop brushes here. Very opaque, covering that up. The parts that are pink that you're seeing through is just where the you know bristles didn't quite cover and uh, letting some of that maybe show through. We'll see a little bit maybe, like the lights hitting the tops of some of these grasses and stuff.
I have a real problem with muddying up my colors once I start doing stuff like that. Uh, is there some kind of something you can tell me? <laughs> yes. Stop muddying up your colors. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. No, um, the truth is, is you want to keep, so again, if you can imagine the color wheel. So if I put a yellow next to a red and they accidentally blend, I've gotten an orange. If I mix a red next to a blue and they accidentally blend, I get a purple, right? Same thing, blue and a yellow, you get a green. But if I put a yellow and a red next to each other, but accidentally get some blue on my paintbrush, then I'm making brown. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, yeah. So it's about contaminating your brush. Okay. And, you know, we, we, it's just like uh, gardening, I always say. It's, you know, they're only weeds if they're in the wrong spot, right? Muddy colors are only muddy colors when they're in the wrong spot. Because the truth is, most of the earth is brown and gray and, you know, slight variations on that. You don't really get super bright, bright colors except for in your, you know, flowers and everything else. Um, or in your nice sunset clouds, I hope. Um, and... Uh, so, yeah, a lot of times it's funny. I'll have, you know, when I'm teaching a workshop, I'll be walking around and helping people and answering questions. And one student will be like, help me, everything's turning brown. And then the, literally the student right next to him will be like, how do I make brown? Um, it's just funny how that happens. How... So it's a matter of keeping clean brushes, keeping uh, your colors separate enough, except for when you want them to, like down here, right? could care less. I've got all red, yellow, blue, brown, you know, I've got all the colors in here because I'm just making dark. All right, I'm going to go ahead and before I start adding in my next step, I'm going to go ahead and find a nice soft, clean brush. So I want to soften that. Uh, what You guys probably can't see it, but I'm seeing a lot of the bristle marks in here. Um, somebody asked me about this the other day, asking if I ever, and again, back to our makeup conversation, right? Blend that mm -hmm. blush. So let's see if I can zoom in, if we can see the top of this guy. Can you see scratchy, kind of a scratchiness to it? Yes. All right. So I'm going to just yes. smooth that out. I'm going to start with my pinks and I'm just going to just a barely touching it. And I'm just using the paint that's there, barely touching it. These brushes suck. They throw so much, so many hairs out. <laughs> especially if you push it in very much. I have totally stolen my wife and daughter's little blender brushes. I think that's probably the most expensive paint brushes I could buy. Um, but I found a resource um, to buy fairly inexpensive ones. I should probably splurge and get a good one someday. Um, but I never used them before. So right now I'm, I went from these kind of warmer areas and now I'm going up into the clouds, the more pink areas. And then I'm gonna, as the <coughs> brush is getting polluted, now I can come back down into my greeny gray colors. Sometimes this is great and wonderful. It just depends on you. Mm -hmm. Do I really want to see my brush strokes? Some of my friends uh, even leave all those little striations where the brush is kind of scratching in the hair. Um, but I think that that looks nice. That looks fantastic. Um, I've tried using a soft, fluffy brush like that with acrylics, and I get the right effect. But then as soon as I need to clean it, it's a big problem because as soon as you get that wet, it's no good anymore. You can't. I, I, I'm surprised because I'm able to clean them with you know soap and water. Oh, no, I mean, yeah, I, I can clean it. But if I'm in the middle of painting and I have like, I don't want to muddy my colors, I want to get the brush clean so I can continue, you know, and I only have four minutes or whatever. 
I can't, uh, when I get them wet, I can't seem to get them dry enough to, to be fluffy again. Oh yeah, no, you are completely right. If I dip this into my paint thinner, it's done for today. Yeah, exactly. That's what yeah, I know. I will end up having like, if I'm doing a lot of this, I'll end up having like five of them out. Ah. Well, guys, put clean it and put the hair dryer on it. There you go. It'll, it'll help take the hairs out that's going to fall out anyway. Yeah. And you dry it really quickly. Brilliant. I like that. And you yeah. don't have to do super hot, just, you know, just medium hot. So I almost just threw this into the paint thinner and I decided let's take a second look just so. And I could do most of this. In fact, um, my students in the past, I wouldn't let them use these because I really wanted them to learn how to make just with a bristle brush, just really soft marks. Um, but you know, we just sped that up and, uh, and you know what, I've, be I've become uh, softer in my old age. I, I used to be a lot more adamant about a lot of things, but really now I'm just kind of like, you know what, use the brush, use the tool that does the job. All right. Here comes one of the fun parts. I'm gonna put a sun in there setting. Oh, you can't even see it. You're missing the sunset. And I'm gonna move this in front of me because I want it, my reflection to come straight down and from an angle it won't probably work. So give me one second, bear with me. But what I'm doing is just marking straight down. If your reflection of your setting sun or whatever else is not straight, like it deviates at all, it looks weird. So it's worth taking your time or fixing it if you mess it up. It's too important. So because this sun is not in front of these clouds, it's behind these clouds, I'm going to have to dampen it down a little bit and make it less strong and less sharp. The edges of it are less sharp because it's showing through you know, the haze of a cloud. A little bit of a give and take. You see, I pretty much erased it. Now I'll get it back a little bit and I'll erase it just really lightly. Just kind of want to make sure it's there, but kind of hidden, which would mean the reflection is the same. Kind of there, but kind of softer than I have it. Like it's so funny where I'm just trying to find desperately a little tiny clean spot on a really dirty towel as opposed to just getting a new one. I'm sure you guys do the same. It's just laziness just strikes in the weirdest of ways. All right. I am liking a lot of what's going on. Um, already, I feel like it's got a lot of mood, a lot of atmosphere. Definitely, definitely different than what we just did. Um, it's just amazing using some of the same colors, lots of the same colors. Um, how different the effects and the mood and the story and the diva. Totally different main character, different focus. Okay, I'm gonna 
save those clouds for just a second and I'm going to pick up crazy brush. Okay, see that all chopped up and dip that into my darks, maybe a touch of quinacridone so it's kind of warm a little bit. Maybe a touch of Indian yellow even. And I'm going to chop in some grasses in here. A little too warm. A little more ultramarine. I'm just using the oddness of this choppy, odd brush to really let my grasses be organic. So I'm not just doing grass, 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 and, and I can change the directions. I'm swirling the brush around so that every mark is slightly different. And then I'm also now going to come back in. And I'm going to lighten up some of that by adding some pink on top, maybe a little bit of yellow. And I'm going to lighten the tops of some of these grasses. So that the radiant light that's in the sky is shining down. Well, it's not very strong radiant light just so that it's not just a big flat dark shape. I want these grasses to have some form, some variety, some personality, not very much. Again, I don't want them screaming for attention. Everybody's here in service of these pink clouds that are coming. They're all just getting ready. Michael, at this point, you haven't used the Brilliant Pink, right? I have not. Well, I mean, it is kind of mixed in here, but I very much doled it down. Um, so if I put the Brilliant Pink, that's a good question. If I put the Brilliant Pink down here beside this other pink, you can see how doled down I made it. And that's because I wanted it in here, because if I had nothing that related to the Brilliant Pink, right, it's like the mother color idea. If nothing related to it, it would just, it would be too much. It would just really clash. So by making it, by making it muted, it will exist within this world, but I'm going to put it up against the really darker area. So my hope, <laughs> hope, 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 is that it uh, is going to sing and take the spotlight. Good question. Thank you. Maybe a little bit of green in these grasses. It's very pink green. I'm making it, you know, there's a lot of that pink in this green, but it's going to be greener than what's gone on there so far. I can decide too, do I want the tops of these trees to have any light on them? Or do I want, you know, just, are they just far enough back there that there's not much detail? I can kind of maybe hint at a little bit. I might let that kind of dry or um, look at it. Plus, when this does dry, I will be scumbling in probably a layer of fog back there to smooth that. Or I could, let's try it. Let's try it now. Since I'm doing wet into wet, and that is literally my challenge to myself in this painting, let's not wait for it to dry. And let's add some fog. Mm. Thank goodness I didn't throw this in the paint thinner. Thank goodness it's not an acrylic painting and I didn't throw it in the paint thinner at this instance. Or if I, I, if I did, if I had thrown it in the paint thinner, I would just, it, okay, so here, if I had decided to put this into the paint thinner to clean it, you know, so it doesn't dry or if you're an acrylic painter into the water, um, and then I brought it up here to 
smooth out this little foggy bank back here, I would literally just remove all the paint or it would make a completely different mark because that's a problem is if you're using mediums or lots of paint thinner in some areas and not in others, you get, there's, you lose the harmony of brush marks. Um, so just so you're aware of that. Kind of destroyed a lot of the tops of those grasses right through there so i've lost some of my texture but that's okay because i can bring it back so quickly if i can find that brush i was just using hiding underneath the indian yellow so let's bring some of this texture across the front of that fog like it's you know these grasses are tall enough that they're poking up Kind of looks like fog. I could definitely do more, but I think it actually does feel okay. Maybe a little bit deeper here. It gets dangerous. I end up holding like four or five brushes in my hand and then grabbing like the wrong brush. So I was just thinking that I got lucky there because I wasn't really paying attention. I could have easily grabbed the brush that had all the dark on it instead of the light and made a funny little mark. All right. Who's ready for some bright pink clouds? <laughs> scary, scary, scary. Oops, hold on. Just beautiful. So how's the gallery there? Hopefully with news of lots of sales. Hey. Any of you guys go? the Cannon Beach and buy a bunch of paintings this weekend? You can tell me. No? Okay. Do you have a show in at Cannon Beach right now? Uh, I always am showing out there. Yeah. At <laughs> Riverside or where? Oh, no, at uh, Dragonfire. The oh, one yeah. underneath Pig and a Pancake there at the end of town, or the end of the main downtown. Oh, yeah, the nicest one. Yay. Good. I'm glad you said that. I will tell them when I talk to them. Yeah, it's it's a fun one, right? It's so colorful and interesting. And I like to tell the story. I've been with them, well, basically 18 years since my daughter was born. Um, so they've been my longest gallery. And they were the one that actually let me or kind of urged me to do landscapes because I was showing my illustration stuff that I used to do. Used to be a children's book illustrator and an animator before that. And uh, I got into the gallery by showing my illustrations, selling my children's book illustrations in the gallery, the ones that, you know, were interesting enough or fun enough. And uh, they came and saw my landscape paintings that I had just been doing for myself, as practice and for, you know, just memories from trips and, uh, or plain air when out camping and stuff. And they asked if they could show them. And as they say, the rest is history almost. I wish it was that easy, but just about. What? They responded positively. And uh, I just felt like I got to retire early and paint what I wanted to paint. Sometimes I miss painting some of the kind of fantasy-esque stuff, but not very often. Did, did you find that your uh, landscape painting sold a lot better than the things that you were painting before? Or do landscape paintings in general sell better than like figurative uh, type paintings or fantasy? Yeah, there's definitely a hierarchy. Um, landscapes sell the easiest. And um, yeah, so I feel bad for people that are like only want to paint still lives and stuff. That's pretty hard to sell or like one of my very good friends only wants to paint nudes and you and uh nudes are really difficult to sell for one there's a lot of galleries that just won't handle them won't uh sell them 
Um, they don't sell that often. And then if you paint male nudes, it's twice, three times, four times harder to sell. I mean, probably depending on your market, but um, but really difficult to sell nudes. I, I um, had some uh, references that I was able to join somebody and go out and we had models um, in, in nature, you know, posing nude, we'd be able to take photos and stuff. And I did not sell, well, actually my galleries wouldn't even take the paintings, which was too bad. So they were fun to paint, you know, beautiful women in a beautiful place. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't paint figures in my landscapes hardly ever anymore. And that's not the only reason why, but. Um, so yeah, it goes, I don't know exactly the order of events, like if it's landscapes and then animals and then still life and then nudes or I don't really know, but. Um, what, what, what about interiors? I don't know. There's some artists who do amazing work and definitely, I don't know. Um, I find like with my landscapes, it generally people like it when it reminds them of something. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I remember this view when I was out dating my, you know, so-and-so and we are on a walk along this marsh or whatever. I don't know. A lot of my paintings will be like, oh, I've been camping there, even though it's a made-up scene. Um, anyways, I just loaded up my brush. So I don't know. Uh, interiors are great. I love, you know, I've got friends who paint beautiful ones um, and they must sell because they keep painting them. But I, I've not, I don't know if I've ever painted an interior that I've tried selling. All right, so I'm gonna have my clouds kind of, I'm trying to think of the dancey shape that I want, right? It's gonna kind of come down here and then kind of through here and then a little guy kind of floating just above. So let's get that little guy in there. Pink. And I'm just letting the brush just barely skim. You see how lightly I'm holding it? And the angle by holding it to the side I'm gonna move it over so I'm not interfering with the camera so much. Um, let's change our lighting too. Let's see if the glare. No, maybe not. Nope, guess not. So I got my little guys, and then it's gonna be slightly breaking into some of the other regions of the canvas. Barely, barely skimming across the top there. Mm -hmm. Just letting, I'm, it's a little bit of planning, but I'm kind of hoping for the best by letting it just kind of dance around a little bit. Got a little bit of, you know, opportunity possibly to kind of go back, but not too much. Crazy diva. It looks wild right now. Needs a director to come in and control her a little bit here. So let's see if I can find a clean brush. I didn't get those clouds too big. So what I can do now with a clean brush. I'm going to take the top ends where they meet the sky on the top. I'm going to mm -hmm. soften. Spread them. See how it gets knocked back? Let's do it over here so you can see it a little better. I'm going to knock most of that back. And so it's not just a big pink, pink shape. I'm going to let it transition into the sky. Softening those edges. Just on the top to start with and see what that does for me.
What color are you using? Just that bright pink right out of the tube. Wow. And now I'm just mixing it with the wet paint that's underneath it. Okay. Excuse my cat. <laughs> Trying to mute. I'm going to wipe out this whole area up here until I get to about here. Just softening those edges so it doesn't just look like a sticker put on there. I want these clouds to feel like they're special and glowing, but they're still of the environment. So just softening some of the edges. Doesn't it feel like they're starting to lay down a little bit? I'm going to go ahead and grab my softening brush and I'm going to get rid of, I don't like this line, these two lines mimicking each other at the same angle. So I'm just going to get rid of one of them. Beautiful, Michael. Thank you. I was a little worried when you put that pink on there. Yeah, it's it's funny building up a thing, right? You're just the whole painting is about this pink. And just with that knowledge that it's coming, it's coming, you know, just kind of fun, just picturing all these guys getting ready, like, okay, the you know, diva's almost here, get ready, everybody in their places. I know I'm really taking that whole diva thing way too far, but it's somehow it's something that remind it just makes sense to me and it helps me to clarify my tell one thing and most paintings tell one thing. Say one thing. That's important what you just said. Everything you it's say important. is important, but cleaner. that that is just really super important. It's the story you're telling. Right. And we've all been with people who were start off telling one story and then all of a sudden it branches into another story. And oh yeah, that, you know, did I tell you about Tom? You know, his wife, Rebecca. Well, Rebecca, she's quite the character, you know. And then her son, Dave, you know, and all of a sudden you're like, wait, what's the story? I thought this was about Tom. Um, and uh He was a good soul that endured them all. <laughs> yeah. I'm always impressed with people who can bounce around in their stories and then like 10 minutes in, you've forgotten what they're talking about. And they're like, well, anyway, that Tom, he's, uh, you know, he's doing great. Yeah, I hope I hope I didn't add too much pink. I think I almost took away some of its specialness 
by making so much, but uh, maybe I'll just keep softening some areas. And then maybe I'll have to remix some of these darks and come back in. But I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you think there's too much pink in there? Is it detracting from its own? I think it looks fantastic. A little bit too intense. I see yeah, that. I think it yeah, I see I the whole. Uh, I see the clouds and don't view the whole painting. Mm. So yeah, I I'm question with... when painting the clouds. Um, yesterday I was looking at the sky. Are the clouds usually darker underneath? I even though I took your cloud class. Oh, well, no, it depends on where the sun is. Okay, so sometimes it could be lighter underneath then. Yeah, a lot of sunsets they're being lit from underneath the clouds. Okay, I was embarrassed to myself because I couldn't remember what the theory was from the cloud yeah, class she no, taught. No theory, it's where is your light source? Okay. okay Thanks. So I was going to subtract some clouds. I think we could subtract this guy. And yeah, what I may do is just have to come back in and make it so only a couple of these clouds are special. And then. Um, maybe darken around them a little bit because yeah i think that that's right and that's what happens especially when you're painting you know all everything all at once um you can definitely run into that mistake so i can do a couple things i can let it dry of course i've still got some of that color from the sky up there i can you know simply start subtracting some of those uh clouds a little bit but it's better now that you um, added the reflection, the, the bright pink reflection. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good. Um, I agree, because then you see the whole painting and not just the clouds. So the values are spread out a little. Very good. Yeah, so, you know, I tried to get it done in an hour. It's not quite done, because I'm, you know, you know <laughs> changes. But it's so far along that I can really judge it. I can really begin to get picky with it and, um, you know, just manipulate what needs manipulating, change what needs changing. And uh, yeah, it's kind of fun just to kind of, well, what happens if that cloud goes away? What happens if that cloud gets lighter? Piece by piece by piece, just kind of, you know, you build it up, then you edit it, or you build it up and tear it back apart. It's all the things. There's definitely a lot of give and take, especially when you're sort of making up a scene, right? Because a lot of times you're just, what if, what if this happened? Oh, okay, that didn't work. What if this? Um, also, I can bring in some Indian yellow and white into the bottoms of these clouds. And all of a sudden, you know, the clouds that I want to be a little more special, it's not all of a sudden the pink is what isn't the most special thing. It's the brightness um, of certain areas. So I've got other tools in my toolbox that I can still come back to, but I still want to try and see if I can All right, well, I'm going to put this camera in front of it so you can kind of get a little bit clearer vision of it. I think it's gorgeous. Uh, I think it's a good start, but thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate it. That looks crazy. Let's make it dark instead. Oh, wow. There we go. A little better in the dark. <laughs> that's no, that's so moody and beautiful. Ooh, I love it. That looks totally different. Bam. All right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. all wet into wet too. It's pretty shiny. So, but uh, yeah, fun, fun, fun. I was thinking about that brilliant yeah, pink. Yeah. I I think it looks like quinacridone red and white with a touch of Naples yellow. I wonder. Naples yellow is so cool, though. But maybe. Not Naples yellow. Indian yellow. I meant Indian yellow. 
And just a touch of white, yeah, could be. And a touch of white and quinacridone red and a touch of Indian yellow. Yeah, I think so. I might experiment with that. I got a couple hours before the next class here, so. Um, what was before. the brand of the pink again? Uh, Michael Harding. Yeah, I wrote it down on the... Uh, oh, okay. Well, I don't have that color, so I'm going to try to make it. There you go. Exactly. If we do share screen. All right. Everybody sees the Padlet page over here? Oh, wow. That so is I so added, I added the reference here. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's a bad photo, but, you know, you get an idea. And wow. then, um, oh, underneath it, my guest color is brilliant pink. So yeah, I mean, you, again, you guys, you do not by any stretch of the imagination need to pay either of these that I, um, I posted. I posted the photo of this. I mean, my painting of it. Um, I, I will wow. post the version. Um, I don't think I have the reference of that. And then I added a couple more photo references this morning. Um, I really like this one. I got to do a six foot version of this for a really beautiful home here in Oregon. That was a neat treat. Uh, it's from Savi Island, if anybody's local here. This is just oh. a pond not too far from my house that it's up on a little bit of a hill, like the top of this hill. And on, in certain light conditions, it's really beautiful. Otherwise, it's really quite boring. It's very flat, but I thought this had such a nice old world feel to it. Um, it does. And then this is quite basic. This is a uh, the Island um, outside of Portland. It's a big rural farm island. Beautiful. Really reminds <laughs> me of old Dutch paintings a lot of the time. But anyways, different kind of a glow, right? With the blue, green, and a little bit of orange. Um, I thought this might be interesting for some of you. You don't need to put these grasses in the foreground or anything. You can simplify it. You can move things around. I like, I like uh, template references like this where they're really open to interpretation you know all these trees can be changed um you know all so many things you can do you could put a little cute crescent moon up here um all sorts of stuff so um, michael would you put uh, would you make if you were painting that you, if you michael was painting that would you use all that green or would you um i painted it similar scene to it um and no i didn't I'm scared of blues and greens, kind of. I like my warm <laughs> colors. Um, but this is beautiful. I, I, yeah, this is an older photo that I kind of ignored. And so when I found it, I was kind of like, oh, that's nice. Maybe I'll revisit it. And it's, you know, I don't want to say it's going to be an easy one, but it's not going to be too, too complicated if you're just experimenting with some concepts. When, when experimenting, you guys, don't go crazy. Don't pick the most complicated scenes. Pick simple scenes. A lot of times, you know, when I'm picking new colors, I'll literally do a still life of one apple. You know, I'll put one light on one apple and then experiment. Um, keep it simple. Like this, again, there's just enough interest in this. Odd shapes and things, but it's really simple. Squint your eyes. It's almost two, barely three values. Um, and really one big shape two big shapes three shapes because they're all connected and four shapes to make it really quite simple keep it simple so michael what would you like us to do for homework um well experiment with transparent color um if you want to do the subtractive style underneath you're totally fine too um, in fact, I would, you know, kind of suggest maybe some of you try that. Um, and yeah, it's getting used to painting over, you know, transparent over opaque and opaque over transparent, back and forth they go. Um, and just kind of discovering the differences. So, you know, paint one, you can paint it really thin, like I did with the first one, you can paint one thicker, or you can do, okay, so that's what I want, thin and thick. Oh, and it can be within one painting if you want. You can have, keep like certain areas of your painting thin and other areas of your painting thick. Um, I'll post a couple of paint. Actually, I did post a couple of photos already from Joaquin Soroya, one of my very, very, very favorite painters. Where's the 
yeah, this gentleman here. Um, I was so amazed when, um, when we took our big trip and I got to see three different shows, well, two shows and his actual studio um, where he had painted. Um, and I was so impressed with, when you get in to see this work in person, how there's just gorgeous transparent, translucent areas where he's letting the light go through the paint, hit the canvas and come back. And then other areas where it's just really thick. And then it, that, you know, that's what really excited me seeing his work. And then when I got to see some more Monet shows, realizing that Monet was doing much of the same, that we think of Monet as just thick and juicy and, you know, big gestural brushwork, but there's actually a lot of transparency in uh, Monet's work. Let's Let's see if we can see any close-ups of his work here that are showing kind of the transparent areas. Uh, people are always attracted to the really thick, juicy areas, but yeah, I mean, here you can almost see raw canvas where he's letting that do some of the work. Um, yeah, oh, here we go. Here's a great example. Thick, thick paint and then really thin paint in other areas. Um, this purple is probably an underpainting. I bet you there's no texture to that at all. And it kind of shows up in different areas of his painting. So anyways, learning to use thick paint and thin paint opens up whole new avenues because you can really, just like the diva, you can let the thick paint be the diva from time to time. You can let the thin paint be the diva. Whatever is the lesser, you know, is more special. Yeah, this is all quite thin. Anyways. It's a fun thing to uh, begin to appreciate. Um, John Singer so, Sargent does a lot of that as well. Uh, all the browns in here are very much just the underpainting, the brownie purples. So you go thin over thick. I mean, thin and then thick on top of it. Yep. Yeah, you can't really do thin on top very well unless it's really dry and then it's then you're doing glazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's transparency. I don't know if that's a Monet painting, but. Anyways, don't need to. You guys can go and look at all of the Monets you want online. Um, very Thanks, good. Thanks, Michael. See Thank you, you next time. Thank you. All Thanks, right, Michael. and I will see a bunch of you later this evening. I've got the. Uh, mentoring starting today there's one spot left if anybody else wants to jump in on it um we filled up nice and quick so um anyways i look forward to uh chatting for a couple hours this evening and um seeing what i can help everybody with and i will uh get back in and comment on paintings because we obviously didn't get a chance to uh do critiquing this week That's but that okay. doesn't mean i'm letting up on you keep sending in your paintings keep painting keep turning them in Thank you, Michael. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bye, guys. Thank you so Super, much. Super lesson. Thank you. Great class. You. Great class. All right. Take Superb care, everybody. class. Superb. Really nice thank to you, see Michael. You all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Toodles. <laughs> Fantastic. Please. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Sandra. Thank Learned you. so much. Motivated to paint. Yeah, get out there and paint. That's the main thing. That's the biggest compliment you can give me. So, Michael, mm -hmm. uh, Susie here, yep. can you hear me? Yep, so yep. that the class tonight, you have to have a painting. You have to show up with a painting, correct? No, no, no. You just show up with a question. Oh, <laughs> okay. No, you show up with nothing. Just show up as a... Did you sign up, Susan? I didn't because... I, I don't have any, I thought you had to have a painting and it's- No, no, we talk about anything and everything art. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just mentoring. So whatever help I can give you that I've gathered over my 20 years of doing this full time. And, you know, basically my goal is to, you know, you don't bang your head on the same things I bang my head on, you know, that I can give you shortcuts and helpful hints and uh, and also motivation and inspiration and there will be homework don't mm -hmm. worry about that you will get really? you know um, so but I'll can you just review it. the homework for this class here 
Um, uh, painting with thin paint and thick paint. Thin paint, okay. Okay, this was a super class. I learned a lot. Thank you for all that you do know. My pleasure. It's always great to see you, Susan. Uh, you too. So you get yourself something to eat. Yep, I already see week. my phone. I'm, I'm getting a shopping list, so I guess I'm going shopping here in between. Uh oh, I'm uh, going to ponder that evening class. I have to ponder that. <laughs> all right, well, you got three hours. <laughs> Michael, you're funny. I'm, I'm taking right now, oddly enough, a, a free sketch class, uh, one of Monet's paintings um, uh, from the National Mu Museum in Washington. It's online. It is free. It's oh, that's 30, really cool. It's 30 minutes of sketching on one of their paintings in the gallery. So I thought I would try that. It's the National Museum in Washington and it's Monet's painting of, I think of it, it's a, you know, a, a landscape. So I'm and gonna do that. you're drawing it with like pencil? Uh, no, I, I could uh, send you the information. It's just- Yeah, well, why don't you put it into the Padlet for the class, so- Okay, we, I sure will. I was thinking of doing that. have a couple other that. people join you. Absolutely. So the only difference is, is that it's five o'clock there, but two o'clock here. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'm not leaving you. I'm pondering <laughs> the other level of class. No just, problem. No, no pressure at all. Love seeing you when I see you. The and, same uh, here. Thank you for all that you do. I've learned so much from you. And my greatest problem is getting started. Once I get started, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I can't see. Absolutely. Much. Absolutely. I've learned so much too when you talk about your own um, journey, how getting started is sometimes a challenge. Okay, I'm gonna let you go. Somebody else might wanna chat. All okay. righty, take care, Susan. Toodles, au revoir, be au revoir. well.